This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my God, this is like my chance. A quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. Welcome back to UC Santa Barbara's Distinguished Lecture Series, the fifth installment of our spring 2015 um, uh, series. And I want to, as always, thank Bynack, Faber, Archibald, and Spray for their uh, sponsorship. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. Great lawyers on the Central Coast focusing on a variety of um, business practices, but startups being their specialty. And we're happy to have them in our community. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter at John Greathouse, and tonight we have with us Simon Dixon. Simon started Rocket Media in Washington, D.C. back in 1991. I was in fourth grade, I think, when he started that. Um, actually, I'm older than Simon, sorry. And what he did was interesting. So a lot of times when you're starting out, you have to, fi you have to find a niche, right? You have to find, um, there's lots of incumbents, lots of other people in the market. You have to figure out how you're gonna make it work. And what Simon specialized in was promotional advertising and media brokering. So actually trading media between different organizations. Um, and he turned that into quite a successful business. In the course of, of working with Rocket Media, he structured transactions all over the world, including China, Japan, Malaysia, as well as the UK. Uh, he worked with some of the biggest corporations in the, in the world as well, General Motors, American Airlines, the Wizards and the Capitals, uh, Clear Channel Communications, CBS, et cetera. So he worked with clients large and small in that capacity. In 2006, Simon moved to Santa Barbara and he merged his company with Idea Engineering, and that's where he is today. He remains the CEO of Idea Engineering, and they focus on branding um, and marketing, and they've worked for some, uh, a number of large, successful brands as well. They do a lot of promotion, copy, design, um, really a full-service media house. Simon is someone who has given back to the community, both in Washington, D.C., where he began his career, as well as here in Santa Barbara. Um, he's been involved in a number of philanthropic endeavors, including the Executive Corporate Fundraising Committee of the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. That's in Washington, D.C. I know here in Santa Barbara, uh, very early on, he became involved in the Women's Economic Ventures. Uh, he's been involved in the Rape Crisis Center. He's, uh, again, someone who's taken his entrepreneurial business talents and applied them in um, areas of philanthropy to make the community a better place. Um, I always tell my students that businesses are built on a foundation of conversations. And the fact that Simon is here today, the fact that Simon ended up uh, merging his business with ID Engineering, um, to some extent, came down to a conversation that I had with him at the end of my driveway in about 2005. He was walking his son, who is in the room with us now, and is no longer his son would no longer fit in a stroller, uh, because that was about 15 years ago. Um, he was walking with his son, and we just met by happenstance, and he said, hey, I'd love to move to Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, it's just a tough town. It's kind of a small town. It's hard to get integrated. Here's what I do. Um, and I said, you know, there's one guy that might be helpful for you to meet. That turned out to be his partner for the next 10 years. So why do I tell you that story? Because it's so important to have your personal pitch who you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. If Simon hadn't been able to articulate that to me in just a few minutes when I didn't know him, he was a complete stranger to me, if he had not been able to articulate to me um, who he was, where he was going, what he wanted to accomplish, he wanted to get to Santa Barbara, he was an accomplished uh, marketing and branding executive, and he was looking for opportunities in, in, in town. I was able to take that information and, and, and introduce him to someone that ended up um, you know, working out really well with him. So it's a, great, it's a great thing for you guys to think about. When is that moment gonna be when somebody has a casual conversation with you that might end up leading to something significant? You have to be ready for those moments. You have to be ready with your personal pitch. Let's welcome Simon to our class. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it.
Thank you. Well, you know, actually, that ended up being a really good segue into this first thing I was going to show you. I was looking today through, uh, through some new materials, and I just happened upon this. And I've shown some of this stuff in class before. People have seen the, the videos from Dove, the various things they put out. Yeah, no? Well, then you won't have seen this. Um, Dove has, I think, done a, an amazing job, and it's why I show their stuff, of making who they are part of their message in a way that really resonates. And while I was looking at some of the stuff I'd seen before, I found this today, and I thought I would just play it. I think it's a good way to segue into what we're going to talk about. It was my choice. And now I will question myself for the next few weeks, maybe months. We had an option of two pathways to walk, and they led to two doorways. It was a bit confronting, actually, to be honest, to see these big signs and feeling like you had to choose and be self-conscious of how you perceive yourself and perhaps if it lines up with how the rest of the world perceives you. I went through the average door. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't even hesitate. Mas eu acho que é mais porque eu me arrependi da escolha porque era diferente do que eu vivo, é diferente do que eu do que eu sou. Am I choosing because of what's constantly bombarded at me, what I'm being told that I should accept, or am I choosing because that's what I really believe? I walked into that door with said average, and I didn't feel really good after that because obviously I had rated myself average and nobody else. Todos os dias eu passo pela porta comum e ontem foi um dia único e eu optei por passar pelo bonita. I wanted to go through the average door, but my mum just pulled me over to the beautiful door. <laughs> it was quite a triumphant feeling. It was like telling the world, I think I'm beautiful. I just wish more young women realized it. If I had given myself the chance to walk through the beautiful door, I think I would choose the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the beautiful door. I think I would walk through the somebody really beautiful looking back at me. Beautiful is a great word. So why not see what's on the other side of that? You're going to walk through doors tonight. They won't be as easily labeled as that one. But every day, you are walking up the doors that way, one way or another. And you're making choices. And it's up to you guys which door you intend to walk through. It's amazing to me how people judge themselves not worthy. And one of my quips when I do these talks, when especially when I'm talking to this age group, is that certainly in your 20s, my general rules are don't go to jail, unless it's for a few days about something you believe in. Don't get some 
some fatal communicable disease that you could have avoided. Don't hurt the people you love. Or, or better yet, anybody if you can help it. Other than that, go for it. And don't be the break on your own life. Life will provide plenty of opportunities for that. And yet, it was, uh, you saw a mother walk up to the average door with her own kid. What message is that sent? <laughs> you saw people who you look at and you could, they're beautiful and they walk through the average door. And again, that was something so obvious, it's just about people grading their own looks. But all the time, people are doing this about everything they ask for. And John was telling the story of when I met him, I was actually with my ex-in-laws at the time, who are kind of like hippies. And so they told me about this guy who had like a, was worked with a software company or something. And I remember thinking, because of them, I was like, well, he probably works in his underwear in his garage or something. And then I see John, I'm like, oh, he looks kind of regular. And, uh, and then that moment happened. And I just spoke to him. I went back to DC, shot him an email. He made one hookup. That started a conversation. And here I am, a bit more than a decade later in Santa Barbara, talking to you guys. Uh, and life is just filled with that. You know, I grew up on the, the northeast coast of England in, a, in an extremely depressed um, coal mining city. And really, I mean, the choices where I was growing up. I remember my, my, my goal was to one day live next door to a less smelly chemical factory. That, that seemed to me that would be hitting it pretty big. I couldn't even imagine a place like Santa Barbara. And I remember taking a career testing, uh, and the guy who gave the test said, you know, he said, you've passed this with flying colors. You could be the manager in a grocery store. And where I come from, that was like hitting it big. And that, so that was, the, that was the world he gave me. And, you know, kind of luckily for me, not that there's anything wrong with managing a grocery store, for myself, I was like, yeah, I think I can maybe hit a little harder than that. And went off and created it. And if there's any message that you get from anything I say tonight, it's don't walk through that door. Let somebody else tell you now. Usually when I start my talks, I throw out a question to the audience, and the only reason I didn't do it tonight is because I kind of forgot, um, but also that some people here I know have seen me talk before. But I just ask the audience, if you could have any job, any career, and I could guarantee you that you couldn't fail, what would you do? And I get great answers. Now, somebody's always going to say, play in the NFL, play in the NHL, the NBA. But then I get, I mean, everything. A truck driver, school teacher, talk show host, geologist, full span. And my response to that is, aside from professional sports, which if you're 22 and nobody's calling you, don't be sitting next to the telephone. <laughs> but outside of that, someone less book smart than you is already doing the job you're talking about. So the only thing between you and that job is you deciding to do it. And I remember hearing a, uh, a headhunter chat once, and, I, and I'm sort of having to work the numbers to, to bring them forward to maybe current salaries, but he ostensibly said, there is 10 times more fighting for the jobs that pay 75,000 than for the jobs that pay 150,000. Because just most people imagine then they can't get that job. They're not worth that job. So there's actually more battling going on for less money, which is amazing. And it's just another version of people walking through that door. <laughs> the flip side of that is I always like throwing this up here, because you guys are flat out in the danger zone for this. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> I think starting roughly my, my son's age, maybe into the mid-20s, although some people never get out of this zone, people defend their position long past the time that they know they're actually wrong. And it becomes more important for them to just win than to be right. And it's always amusing to me because the second you admit you're wrong, you get to be right. So I don't know why you'd put that moment some point into the future. But people do, we get caught up in that. And last week, I was chatting to some guys at the university, and, um, and I ended up meeting with a couple of them, actually, for, for coffee. And so I was chatting with them, and I said, you know, it's a funny thing. At the end of, of this talk, a few people asked about LinkedIn. And so I said, okay, well, if somebody wants to link, link to me, just shoot me a link. I said, but if all you do is press the button that says, I'd like to connect to you on LinkedIn, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna respond. You're gonna have to go one more step than that. And I don't do it to be a jack wagon. I do it because that's life. People always say to me, what can I do to, to be different? 
Well, how about putting in about 10 words into freaking LinkedIn versus the ones that come already order generated? You just, when at that moment when you press that, you're saying I'm the same as all the other guys who don't care. The ones I go and have coffee with were the ones that actually sent me something more than that. And so, as you're, I keep running into when I do these talks, people wanting to know, you know, essentially how do I brand myself? How do I stand out? I'm gonna be graduating from college. All you guys are gonna graduate. All these other guys are gonna be graduating. And the differences so often aren't knowledge-based. You know, as I somewhat depressingly say at times, I could buy all the knowledge in this auditorium at the end of a one-minute phone call for not a lot of money. So if you think that's the major difference, you're dreaming. But that's okay, because it wouldn't what I'd be looking for if I'm talking to you. Because if I wanted more experience, I would just buy someone 10 years older than you and get it. So if I'm having that conversation, it's knowing what you're bringing to the table, at least knowledge-wise, but there's other ways you can be making a difference. And those are the ones really to work on. And as I was having this conversation over coffee, it really was just be that guy. But even today, I was de dealing with some stuff to do with college, and somebody didn't come through on something, and there was almost an expectation of that being, that being kind of normal. Well, okay, but, but it's not what anybody enjoys. So don't be that. That's why you actually make the bigger difference is being reliable, having good judgment, not fighting over things you don't know. Only for the people who've never seen me talk. I'm looking at you. Where's the brand in this picture? What were you pointing at? Uh, well, it's Macy's. Okay. Macy's, okay. Anywhere else? Where, where, where's the brand? Bags. On the bags, okay. Okay, well, that's where I tend to get the bags, the star, the Macy's. No, that's not where the brand is. The brand is there. Mm. <laughs> Whatever people think you are, you are. And, and to some extent, frankly, what you think you are, you may well be. You saw a lot of beautiful people walking through the average door. Even though it plainly wasn't if beauty was the aspect, it wasn't true. If this guy here thinks your product sucks, it does to him. And which means it does to the wallet that sits in his pocket. So how you communicate to people what you are matters. The truth is all great, although not many people are gonna have the time to go furrowing for the truth they're gonna look at you and make, make judgments about who you are, or who your product is, what your service is. And you know, Apple is a great an example in this, is, I mean, their brand is half of their stock price. Um, they've done a great job of making people believe they understand what that company is. And it was interesting, I was having a conversation with my son about Microsoft today. And, um, and there was an article, I think, we both saw it in the week. And I sort of seen this about a year ago, that Microsoft really is slowly becoming hip again, which is kind of unimaginable five years ago. And I used to say, still somewhat true, Apple is the company that people imagine Microsoft to be. Apple often stifles innovation. They're extremely litiginous. I'll probably get sued for saying that. Um, but they're a company that everybody loves and adores and will pay extra money for their products. Microsoft's put a lot of money into being innovative, but they still are carrying this, we tend to refer to as the brand gap, of the company that people thought they were five years ago and maybe actually were 10 years ago. Well, I was gonna do that one, but instead I'll do this one. So a lot of what I talk about when I just say how to differentiate, the biggest one, man, if you really wanna pull away, is just judgment. And it shocks me at times how people, even very educated people, mature people, people have been doing what they do for a while, take their eyes off the ball, and this, this is just, this story you actually probably won't believe, so I just would say if you don't, go look it up afterwards, you'll find out I'm telling you the truth. Um, back in the late 90s, uh, Hoover was bought by Maytag. And in England, where I grew up, Hoover was so dominant in the market that I'd actually never heard a vacuum cleaner be called a vacuum cleaner until I moved to the United States. It's a Hoover. That's what you would say, oh, where's the Hoover? Oh, I'm hoovering the carpet. I'd never heard somebody say vacuuming before. I mean, they just own the space. And so Maytag buys Hoover and they want to introduce their own product lines and so they essentially want a way to get rid of the products they, they, they're, they're already sitting on. 
And so they look to their marketing geniuses for some sort of campaign to get this stuff out the door. And so let's just to use some guess numbers. How much do you think a ticket from, let's say, London to Rome might cost on a plane? What do you think? 100 bucks. All right, let's say 100 bucks. So two would be $200. Price of an average Hoover vacuum, you think? Yeah, 200, maybe even 100. I mean, you know, and the tickets might cost a little bit more. Certainly, at the low end of that scale, the vacuum's 200 and two tickets is 200. Their marketing genius comes up with this idea. Hey, let's have a sale where if you buy a Hoover, a vacuum, you get two free tickets anywhere in Europe on a plane. Anybody see any problems with those numbers? Really not looking to make a lot of money there. And you've got to remember, they're, they're not getting all of that money. When it's sold, some of that's going to the retailer. So I would say that Hoover's already, even on the math we just did, Hoover's upside down. So they have this sale. And a couple of things companies rely on when they're doing mail-in rebates is firstly, most people don't get around to doing it. And, and bizarre as it may seem, if you're running a rebate plan, if you want to make sure people don't send in the rebate, you give them lots of time to do it. If you give them a year, they almost certainly won't get it. Because people keep, oh, I've got, I got a ways longer. And all of a sudden, like, oh, bugger, I didn't do that. Versus one week where it's like, oh, I better get that done right now. Another way is they make kind of the rules very arcane. So if you make any kind of a mistake filling it something in or putting your address on the wrong set, they can just kick it out of there. So Hoover starts this program. And they start selling a lot of vacuums, blowing the stuff out. So they're all very excited. Uh, and if I read right, it got so much that they actually, instead of just getting rid of the stuff they wanted to get rid of, they were so enjoying these sales that they increased production of the stuff they were trying to get rid of, even though, as we just figured out, you and I, they're not making any money doing this. The marketing genius comes back and said, this is awesome. I have a phenomenal idea. So what's a ticket from London to the United States? Oh, you fly cheap. But let's say it's 500. So two of those would be $1,000. The marketing guy says, hey, it's working so well. Let's make it two tickets to the United States instead. OK, the vacuum's still costing 200. The tickets are now costing 1,000. Anybody seeing problems? Well, now it goes insane. And this is where it comes onto my radar screen because my niece shows up in the United States to visit me. Now, I know she doesn't have two red cents to, to rub together. I'm like, how'd you get here? I figured her mother paid. She goes, no, no, I, I bought a Hoover. All right. okay. <laughs> and she explains this to me, and she explains to me. I start laughing because I'm like, well, that obviously isn't true. No one would be stupid enough to do that. So I look into it, it's like, wow, somebody would. The other thing they'd forgotten to do was put a limit. She'd bought five Hoovers <laughs> and had got 10 tickets to the United States that could be used at any time because I hadn't put a time limit on that either. It got so bad in England that people were literally, I kid you not, on their wedding invitations, amongst all the other things, it would say, no Hoovers, please. <laughs> Hoover eventually, when it really, really realized it went bad, is because the new market just ran out because the used market was colossal. Everybody had boxes of Hoovers that they were trying to sell. And this was the point where they suddenly realized, we may have a problem on our hands here. And so then all the rebates started coming in. And, and it's, I almost at times feel that Hoover was trying to do me a solid in case I ever wanted to tell this story. So their way out of this was they just decided they weren't going to pay. And that's what they said. Yeah, yeah, that, that was kind of a mistake on our part. So, well, we're just not going to honor that, which, which turns out to be illegal. Um, so then it became a national story. And just to doubly screw them, the national newspapers in England ran large articles explaining to people exactly how to fill the forms out correctly to make sure you got your vacuums. When the dust finally clears, Hoover loses 50 million pounds on this one promotion. And it just it kills the company. They, they, Maytag sells it for like just debt to an Italian firm, like debt plus a dollar. So just bad judgment, somebody signing off on things, not even bothering to do the math that you would have figured out, right? It's shocking at times. I, I mean, I have the th a personal thing, I call it the Golden Child Movie Award. If you've ever seen the movie Golden Child, if you've never seen it, 
maybe don't bother unless you like the pain. It was an Eddie Murphy movie, but it was the worst movie I ever saw. And every year I kind of personally give some movie or another the Golden Child Award. But it occurred to me that script went a lot of, across a lot of desks, including the desks of guys financing it before somebody made this crummy movie. This thing, the CEO at some point must have seen this thing going on. And somehow nobody stood tall and said, dude, <laughs> I, I'm working the numbers here. I'm not seeing how this works. Going back to my coffee, be that guy. If you're that guy, you're invaluable. You know, and going back to, to, to my last time, I, somebody came up to me, and I tend to talk to a group of, of people, and somebody was asking me about being an intern. Do you take interns? I'm like, you know, we never really have, because what happens is people show up saying, can I be an intern? Well, you're now asking me to do work, because I've got to figure out something to do with you. So basically, my job's now your job? I don't know. So I said to the person asking that question, come to me with a solution. Come to me with something I can say yes to. Don't just come and ask me, can I be an intern? Come and say, hey, I was on your website, and I noticed you don't seem to do a lot of this, and I have some skills. Oh, come up with some skills of, hey, I'm good at social media, and maybe I could help. Come with something I can go, wow, that sounds like a good idea. Sure, let's give that a try. Never heard from the person I said that to. Be that guy. As I've said before, if her last name wasn't Hilton, she'd be bagging groceries right now. Except I suspect she probably couldn't do that very well. <laughs> but a lot of tech companies make this mistake. About a year or so ago, I was speaking at a high school here in town, and I asked the question of the class, how many people here have heard of MySpace? Tumbleweed blown through the classroom. MySpace, what, what's MySpace? And I said, well, MySpace was Facebook. And now they're just, what the heck are you talking about? How, what, Facebook? I'm like, they just disappeared. Uh, and you know, back in the days where only stupid money was being paid for dot coms instead of insane money, they sold for like $250 million. And a couple of years later, they sold for maybe 20. Um, because they didn't really have a brand. Nobody really knew why they liked them. Nobody knew what, what bound them, except they were famous, kind of like her, famous for being famous. And the problem with that is very ephemeral. It can just evaporate again. If people don't know why they want to be with you other than, you know, you're somehow cool, well, what's cool? Cool just, just, just flows away. A brand needs to be something more. And tech companies have a, a lot of problems with this. I, there's no other industry that I meet up with where they demand that you've worked on some other tech brand. I, I, I work with, with various brands. For me, it, it helps, I believe, it, for my own company because we're constantly having to reflex our muscles on learning about some new space, it makes us dig down. Whereas people, if they think, well, I know what cool is, they just think you can just pull cool out of the air, which you really can't. And it's why a lot of these brands get done very poorly. And it's worth looking at this. This is done by Interbrand every year. They do, it's like a top 100, actually. But most of these companies are not new and hot. I mean, Facebook, on this list, Facebook leapt up the list to get to number 30. The year before, they were, they were at least double that distance down. Twitter, I don't think, is even the top 100 of this. But some of these companies, I asked this question before once. How many people here know what IBM stands for? I mean, that, that's kind of amazing. When I was a kid, IBM, international business machines, they were like Apple and Google rolled into one. They, in many ways, they were the symbol of the United States. And now people don't even know what their letters stand for. And they're, they're still a strong company, but they're not the giant they were. And it kind of came up just this evening. I was chatting with my son, and he was saying, you know, well, Apple could never go anywhere. Nothing could happen to Apple. I'm like, really? How about Pan Am? What about IBM? These are big companies, some of which Pan Am's just gone. That was, this, I mean, that was the airline of America. No one could have believed it would go away, it went away. Most of these companies have been around GE, it's 100 years old. Uh, Toyota, kind of forever. So, you know, Microsoft, Apple, then Google, kind of the newer guys, but most of these companies do a really good job of you knowing kind of what they stand for. And you might not be able to verbalize it easily, but you feel it inside yourself, and that's not by accident. I'm a lucky owner of that car. And 
as I always say about it, it does not get good miles per gallon, but it gets awesome smiles per gallon. Uh, and I always get asked, hey, what mileage does that get? I'm like, could there be any good answer to that question? I'm only going to get depressed if I ever figure it out. So I just gas it and drive. But one time, and amazingly only one time, because most people love this vehicle, one time I remember somebody shouting out at me, global warming, as I'm driving up State Street. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, I can't fight it. I, I mean, you know, this does burn its way through a lot of fossil fuel. But in the rest of my life, do you know the other 23 hours, 55 minutes of the day when I'm not behind this? I am an environmentalist. I don't, you know, I recycle, I don't have AC in my house, obviously that's easier when you live in Santa Barbara, but nonetheless, I could have it in there. Uh, there's various things that I do. I consider myself a, a committed environmentalist who just happens to like honking big American motored cars. That's fun for me. And, and when I advise nonprofits, um, something I, I just, I feel a need to talk to them about, and I, and I have them fairly regularly, is don't demand that I'm 100% like you. Don't require me to have all of your beliefs before we can kind of be friends or do business so you can feel that we could work together in some way because that's demanding too much. And whether it's by guilt or anything else, you could get a lot out of me and you could get a lot of partnerships by allowing people to be themselves and yet allowing a certain amount of themselves to align with you. as you head out there into the world. We've been hearing a lot over the last few years of content is king, and I feel the need to stick that word in front of it. Good content is king. The rest is verbal diarrhea. And it's, sh well, you know, the, the, the web has put a demand for so much content that it's just spewing out all over the place. And when we build websites, well, when we rebuild websites, we're doing a big one right now for a governmental organization, their new front page is gonna have a fifth of the information it had on previously. And I bet it's five times easier for anybody to find what they want. Because there's this feeling, and it especially happens in academia, where, well, why, why, why wouldn't we just put all the knowledge right there on the front page so it can be there for people? And what you build is a Gordian knot. And this same stuff applies to you when you're branding you. Be judicious about what you're talking about. Figure out what people actually might want to know about you. It is not that you're cool. The, the most pedestrian things can be what people are looking for. And I'll get to a couple of those in, in a couple of minutes. That's my social media slide. And it kind of ties into the previous slide, which is to say, if your message is confusing, if you don't tell the story of you or your product or your service very well, then all social media is gonna allow you to do is confuse people on a much larger scale than you were doing it prior to going onto social media. And that's kind of what John talked about before he pulled me up on stage, is I was able to explain to him very quickly what I did and he was immediately able to think, oh, actually, I know who you should talk to. And that worked out. And, and it's amazing to me how not just, not just people, how many brands don't do a good job of just telling the world who they are, explaining why. Well, as I've been known to say, when I go to parties, everyone knows how to do my job. I think you know, the brain surgeon and the financier doesn't have people coming up explaining how they should do their job better. You're in marketing, everybody's an expert. And if you, uh, if you want to truly explain who you are, you need to put it in a language of the people that you are talking to. Uh, I tend to say that people don't care who you are, they care what they are in you, which is to say, why is my life better? Because I know you. Why is my life better? Because I'm using your product. Why is my life better? Because your service is available to me. If you can tell your story in that way, people can see themselves in you. They can see the benefit to them. And it's very important to, to sum yourself up and sum up your products that way. This is something that's kind of, kind of new to me over the last couple of years, and I'm slowly th threatened to write a book about it. Um, this confusion was huge in my life. And 
And I, you know, it's a personal story. A few years ago, I was dating somebody. I was not happy in the slightest. And I remember driving along, pulling up at an intersection, and I said, I love this person because, and I had nothing, just nothing. And, and you know, me being self-torturous, I, I continued to date that person for another year or so. <laughs> but, uh, but in the aftermath of that, and looking back on it, because I, I just I knew this was like an important learning moment for me, and I really saw how it fits in just with life in general, and even ties all the way back to the very first video that we watched which is people get love and like confused. And like is this external emotion. It happens outside of us, and it is something we can quantify. I can pick somebody out of the audience, and I can say, hey, I like this guy. I mean, maybe I've met him for 10 minutes. I like this guy. I like his smile. I like the way he dresses. He actually he, he works uh, part-time for a charity, and I really believe in what they do. And you know, I like his interest in some kind of music. So yeah, I just like him. I can look to the next person over and go, yeah, well, I don't like him because, you know, he worships Satan and he dresses kind of funny and I can come up with a few things. And so you really can take a set of rules and apply it to different people and you make these decisions about what you like and what you don't like. You do that and it all takes place outside of you and it's all very cold and it tends to be how we make friends. Love, on the other hand, is a wild, snorting, untrainable beast that we kind of have no control over, and it happens inside of us. Like is outside, love is inside. And, and, and I always say, there are six billion people on this earth who if they call me, I'll decide if I'm, when I'm gonna get around to answering that phone call. There is one person sitting in the back of this audience that when I think it's her calling me, I am slapping leather faster than Wyatt Earp. That's love. That's something inside of me. It's, it's what you feel when you are thinking about that person, next to that person, um, loving that person. The problem with love is it's not clean that the, the like is. Love can be driven by lots of strange things. Love can be driven by dark things in your past. Certainly was to me. And so this, this feeling wasn't coming from good things. Bad things were setting it off. And I think it's why a lot of marriages end in divorce, because people are like seven to 10 years in, the love changes a little bit, and they suddenly realize that with someone they actually don't like, they're finally looking at them in the cold light of day that they would with anybody else when they first meet them, that they weren't, didn't have the hots for, and now they're going, oh, I actually don't like you. That's a problem. You know, you see these articles in Vogue, how to rediscover the love. Yeah, if you don't like them, you're not rediscovering some love. You can't do that to yourself short of a lobotomy. And so with brands, it's important these two things exist. And so as I said, tech firms tend to be at the love end of the scale. They just want you to love them. And when that goes away, you've got nothing left holding the thing up, your relationship. And it's why big, big tech firms can just evaporate. MySpace just went away, it, went, it became uncool. Who wants to be using or caught using a company that's uncool? Dot coms, no, sorry, dot com, um, charities, nonprofits tend to be at this end of the scale. They tend to brand themselves on the like end. And they make themselves just a sum of what they do. We stand for these things. We do this. Some companies do it too. And a problem with being at that end purely is if you are, if the sum of who you are is a list of the 10 things that you do, well, if I have a company that does the same 10 things but does it for 20% less money, you're gone. If I have a company that does your 10 things and two more for the same price, you're gone. And so you need to have both of these things in existence. But it's important in your personal life too. I know that there's a ton of people in this place who are loving people they don't like. Work on that. So I always love this story. Flag on a stick. I looked this up today. We're seeing these for sale for 75 bucks wholesale. Client of mine loves going on uh, those kind of high-end vacations. She treats herself well. And she was down in, I think it was St. Bart's, and ran into a couple, you know, not old, well, young by my thoughts, ancient by yours, probably like mid-40s. And she got to chatting, it was obvious they were retired. And so she asked them, you know, well, so what, what, what happened? What put you in this position? And the guy said, well, it's kind of a funny story. 
we were on vacation. I think the guy might have even been a school teacher. We were on vacation, and we were in Las Vegas at one of the big hotels, like the, the Mirage, whatever, the, the thousand people around a, a pool, and the guy wanted to get a drink. And so he puts his hand up, he's trying to get a waiter. And he is trying to get a waiter for 10, 15 minutes, and he can't get a waiter. He's getting kind of bent out of shape. Plus, he's not now talking to his wife or the friends he came there to be with. Uh, he's, he's kind of getting upset. So by the time a waiter comes, he's not happy, gets his drink finally, at which time he sucks it down, and he's got another minute wait for the next one. So he gets home with the idea to do something about this. And he invents the flag on a stick. And the idea of this is rather simple. It's kind of based on your letterbox. If you're sitting in one of these chairs and you want a drink, you pull up the flag on a stick and you get back into your conversation. And eventually a waiter's gonna spot the flag on a stick and is gonna come by and ask you what you want. At which point you can put the flag down and get on with life again. So he came up with this idea, kind of amazed that nobody else had. Through a friend of a friend, he gets a conversation with, I don't know, some hotel chain, Hilton. And they order like 20, 30,000 on the spot. 75 bucks a pop. And eventually he's just selling them to everybody. And that will retire you into St. Bart's. And I just want to point out, he didn't come up with Google. He came up with a flag on a stick. And it's just my bet that everybody in this room has the brains to come up with a flag on a stick. I really do. It's all nice if you can come up with an idea that makes you a billionaire, but I mean, is a multimillionaire not enough? I think it could be, and I think you could do a flag on a stick. And the other one I love is this. So when I was, you know what always amazes me, does anybody work in restaurants anymore? Anyone? It's amazing. Like 20 years ago, every freaking hand would have gone up, but I guess times have changed. I loved working in restaurants, it was a ton of fun. So if you haven't, maybe give it a try for a while. But anyway, my least favorite job was ketchup marrying. I don't know what it is about ketchup, but it is the one, it's the dirty condiment. It doesn't apply somehow to Tabasco, mustard, or anything else. But with ketchup, when the bottle has like two and a half inches gone, people treat it like it has Ebola. They want a fresh bottle. It just becomes dirty. And so if you're working in a busy restaurant like I would work in, you were sweeping out ketchup bottles. Pretty much every time a table switched over, you'd have to switch out the ketchup and throw in a new one. So at the end of the night, for the whole restaurant, there may be a couple of hundred ketchup bottles sitting there all partially used. And it was someone's job to marry the ketchup bottles. You had to top up the bottles from each other until you had all the ones that could be filled filled. Total pain in the keister. And this is the way life was for I don't know how long. I mean, how long has ketchup been around? A long time, gotta be at least 50 years until some genius, and I mean, I've always said, when, when they have the conventions of, of, of condiment manufacturers, this guy must get carried in on everyone's shoulders. He just said, you know, if we just made the bottle red, nobody would know how much ketchup is in there. <laughs> you laugh, it took 50 years till somebody said that. But that's what they do. Now they make the bottle red, and now in restaurants, you don't care how much you, you get a red bottle, you use it. And, and I've always thought, I have no proof in this, I bet it's cheaper to make a red ketchup bottle than it is to make a clear one. So they're probably even saving money there, too. Again, everybody in this room is smart enough to come up with an idea of just painting a bottle red. And yet, the amount of man hours, millions of man hours a year are saved just by that idea. I don't know what's going on there, but let's go on with this. How many people here have seen the Apple ad from 1984? How many people haven't? That's enough. All right. Well, I love this. It, it, it's seminal, and who has seen it too many times? No one. Let's watch it. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification that was created for the first time in all history. A garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory force. The creation of the force is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to us. January 21st, 
24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. So here's a way you can be like Apple. Like it says there, be somebody. Because that's what their success comes from. And just going back to when this ad came out in 1984, when they launched the Macintosh, that company that nobody knew what the letter stood for, International Business Machines, IBM, owned computing. It was IBM and a bunch of bit players. And the idea that these guys would come in and challenge them was kind of laughable, quite frankly. But they brilliantly positioned themselves, essentially, the not IBM. If you want to be like we are, then this will is, this is, be a home for you. And there was enough of those people. But the, the genius of Apple is that here we are 31 years later, they're still that firm. And reliability is a big deal. You know Apple. I mean, you feel like you know them. The, the, that, that's why you love their products, is because you feel that you know what they stand for. You, again, you may not be able to verbalize it, but there's a, there's a safety net. And that really comes from, in 1984, Steve Jobs kind of decided what this company was going to be, and they've just stayed being that. And, and I often put this in the human terms, because it's amazing how many companies don't get it. If you came back from a date, or well, several dates with someone and was talking to me and said, you know, I've been on five dates with this guy and uh, I never know what I'm going to get. He's a different guy every time. I mean, like, not the same person. You're not talking about someone you're feeling really good about. It's kind of scary, really. Is it going to be a six day? I don't know. And yet, so many companies, they're a new flavor. Every year, there's a story from early in my career where I kind of had to make, it, make a choice for myself. And it wasn't an easy choice because I wasn't making tons of money at the time. I was still young and had just started my own first company. And I did primarily automotive advertising, which is like the Wild West with car dealers. And I had my biggest account. And they got a new general manager, a new guy running this place. And they were a big, it was a dealership, but they were big. They spent a lot of money. And the new guy sat me down. And he said, I want you to give me five new ideas a month of how we're going to advertise. And it was just this seminal moment for me, because I knew what the, pro, what the long game probably was going to be of my next comment. And I just said, you know what? How about I, instead of five new ideas a month, I give you one great idea for the year? And he didn't want that. And I, I had to make my choice. Well, what kind of advertising am I going to do? And I, I decided, OK, well, I'm going to walk from this. Because I don't, I don't want to be doing that. I don't believe in that. Sometimes life will, will throw those to you. Um, if I didn't say it earlier on, just something I, I say, and, and I really can't impress this enough. By and large in life, you regret the things that you don't do much more than the things that you do. I say that with limits. But the ones that haunt you are the things that you'd wish you'd done and you didn't. Even, even when I had my coffee a couple of days ago, I threw out a question to the classic. I was like, man, I knew that, and I didn't put my hand up. It's like, it's been haunting me since. OK, well, I remember I still it took me a decade to get over. I, I've always been kind of left wing when it came to animals, animal rights. And I was early in my career again. I, I was in advertising. I had a lot of reason to do what I did. I, I was an illegal alien. This guy was going to bat for me to get, to get me some residency in, in the country so I, could, so I could live here legally. And it was another car account. They wanted to do buy a car, get a free mink coat. And I'm like, that's against everything I believe in. And I decided to knuckle down under. I was like, you know, what are you going to do? Leave the job? You can't get another job. You're illegal. I'll have to go back to like waiting tables illegally. And so I did it. it took me 10 years, I kid you not, to, for that to stop haunting me. So take that for one. You, what you, what you uh, want as you walk out. But Figure out what you want to be. I mean, really figure out what you want to do. And, and I go back to the question I didn't ask. What do you really want to be in this life? Because had I asked that question that I told you about, what do you want to be? If you couldn't fail, what would that be? If that's not what you're studying, there's a question to ask yourself. Because if you don't do what you want to do, if you don't do what you have a passion about, you're going to have your ass handed to you for the next 40 years by someone doing the same job at you as you who actually is doing what they want to do, because they're having fun. They're getting up every morning. They're eager to get to work. You're getting up every morning going, 
still another day of this. Figure that part out. So there's a certain kind of ad, and I call them flying monkey commercials. And we've all had this moment. So the Super Bowl, you see all the people say, we, 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 watch the, we watch it to watch the commercials. And you'll have a conversation with someone. Oh, man, I saw that great ad yesterday. Oh, it was the greatest ad. I'm like, yeah, what, what was it? I'm like, oh, man, there was, there was a flying monkey. There was the Swedish bikini parachute team. There was a guy shot out of a cannon. It was incredible. And I'm like, oh, wow, what, what was the commercial for? And I, was that the Bud Light commercial? Or was that the Doritos commercial? Yeah. OK. <laughs> How can it be a good ad? You can't even remember who it's for. I would like to think at the end of one of my commercials, people would you know, hit the pause button on the TiVo and run to the store to buy whatever it was I'm hawking. But at the very least, they should think better about you than they did at the, before those 30 seconds had passed. And if they can't remember who you are, that didn't happen. And I like to show these two commercials. They're, they're about probably three years old now. But both of these were in the Super Bowl a few years back. Hey, dog. Anti-bark cobbler. You want a Dorito? You gotta speak. Speak. Ah, oh, come on. That was the number one ad. That came top. And I mean, it, it's fun. You guys laugh, that's OK. You didn't break any rules. But it's entertaining. And people get confused in marketing all the time between entertainment and the real job, which is to sell something. It might be literally to sell a pair of jeans, but it might be just to sell a point of view or a service. But it's selling something that you can actually get your head around. The, 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 the feeling of what you feel about that company. And just making somebody laugh doesn't achieve that. It can. There can be a reason that to make a, an ad funny, but it should be for a reason. Here's the other ad I like to show. I love that ad. Uh, I mean, I'm like the Klemp still when I watch that, and I watch it a lot of times. It, it's just genius. Now, this ad came number 45 in the poll, so like halfway down the pack. I believe that ad belongs in the Pantheon along with uh, the Apple ad. It's, I think it's just that good. And it's so simple. All you're doing is looking at the very screen that you look at when you're using the product, and then it just shows you how the product is used. It translates for you. You can search flights. It makes suggestions. It corrects your spelling. All the things that you do with Google wrapped into this beautiful story that kind of is really moving. But people weren't entertained. And there's a line I like to quote from a movie called um, The Usual Suspects, which if you haven't seen, watch this movie. But there's a line from there where a guy says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is making people think he doesn't exist. And I sometimes think that good marketing is kind of that way. People will tell you, oh, marketing has no effect on me. Meanwhile, they're wearing advertised clothes and driving their advertised car and about to go off and drink an advertised beer. Um, it's kind of one of the joys of being an advertiser and that people think maybe it doesn't have any effect on them. It makes the job actually a little bit easier. There is no trick to this slide. That's just general advice. Um, when I tell people what I do, sometimes the reaction is, oh, so you're the guy who makes me buy things I don't want. 
And my response is, uh, there may be guys in marketing who do that, but if you're doing it right, what you really should be doing is providing people with a compelling truth that allows them to make the best possible decision about you. That's a good rule for marketing, and it's a good rule for life. You are going to be marching off sooner or later into the wide world, and you're going to be asking people to make decisions about you. There's the ones you make about you, walk through the beautiful door, and there's the ones people make about you. And the way you bond and make great relationships is to do that, is to allow them to make a decision about you. And it may be a decision not to hire you, but they'll be glad that you tell them the truth, because if you really want to bend someone out of shape, don't be the person that you told them they are. It happens way too often, sadly. I'm going to miss these couple out. Except this one. I found this interesting. I found this today. This is the men's version of Dove. This just came out. Daddy. 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 Dove Men Plus Care. Care makes a man stronger. I would so advise them not to make that ad. Uh, luckily, I can separate it in my mind away from the women's one, because I think it takes away. The women's one makes so much sense. They're talking about beauty, and the product that they offer is a real beauty product. The whole thing about Dove is the purity of the soap. So it makes sense, the space that they're working in. This one just feels like a reach. It's like, oh, well, the other one worked for the women, so let's make people cry about being a man. And by the way, let's, let's get some moisturizer out the door. <laughs> and that's kind of sad, because now I, I wanted to believe, because somebody would ask me this, well, do you think they really believe in that? And I'm like, why do I care? I'd like to think they do. And it's good that what they're doing is good, so that's good. I mean, I, I'd like to believe they do, and what the heck, I will, because it's good. And now this makes it all maybe a little bit more suspicious. Like, wow, maybe they don't care after all. They may have, it might be a net loss running this campaign. This one's a local product. The guy, I mean, look, I think it's actually a kind of a cool product. It's, it's you know, it's a safety razor. And, and built into its base is a, is a, is a honing um, device. where So every time you put that thing back in its holder, it resharpens the blade. And it go, goes for like five years. So every time you use it, it's as if it's the first time. Because for those who use especially razors like this, after about four or five shaves, it really starts to hurt because you've blunted the blade and you've got to switch them out. So this guy came to me and, and was talking about maybe if I, I'd work with him, but we, we couldn't come to terms. That's, that's the best I'd say on camera. And, um, and so then later, he sends me this ad, I remember, saying, so what do you think of my ad? Yeah, uh, I, I guess I have an aura about me that I like to work for free. Um, but he sends me this, and so I was like, I'm not going to work for free. But I, I went back, and I remember saying, I'll just give you one thing. Firstly, your name, Born Sharp. I was like, isn't every razor on planet Earth Born Sharp? I mean, isn't like a five cent Bic Born Sharp? The whole idea of this razor is it freaking stays sharp. The whole brand premise is off right from the beginning. All razors are born sharp. And then for the Christmas thing, what's Santa doing? <laughs> you pick the one guy who has a huge great beard that he's never going to shave off. <laughs> why is he with your product? And also, why is he on a plane? <laughs> I don't know where you even get this photograph from. Why would anybody even think to put Santa on a plane? Maybe an airline, but, but what's it got to do with his razor? Totally don't get it.